Hello and welcome back to the Joe's Art History Podcast, a podcast which celebrates all things art historical every single day. Oh, it is so good to be back with a fresh episode after a week off, a well needed and well deserved week off if I do say so myself. But I'm delighted to be back with a brand new episode and today is episode 27 and I sit down with artist Brian Keeld to discuss how different artists tackle the practice and concept of drawing. When Brian suggested talking about this, I had never really given much thought to the history and importance of drawing within art. But as you will see from our chat, where we take a deep dive into the works of five artists, no two approach drawing in the same way, nor hold it in the same importance within their practice. From the sketchbooks of Leonardo da Vinci and the loose markings of Maggie Hambling to the final work of Francis Bacon and erased masterpieces, Brian and I ask the questions. Is drawing important? When did collecting drawings become part of the norm in the art world? And, most importantly, if an artist draws on a napkin, is it a work of art because it's by the hand of an artist? Or is it just a doodle? This is an excellent chat which really got me thinking about how varied everyone's approach to drawing is and that really there is no right or wrong way of drawing. It's just something that comes down to personal taste and personal practice. This is a really brilliant chat with Brian and I'm so excited for you guys to listen so just sit back and relax as Brian and I discuss is drawing important. What's really got you interested in this topic of sort of exploring the concept of how different artists approach drawing? Well, for me, drawing is the crux of what I do as an artist. And I've always been really been interested in how other artists approach it uh, and how they gauge it with their own, within their own practices. We've all drawn something at some point as a kid. We've all had that experience of, you know, opening up a book that you shouldn't and just scribbling a crayon over the writing and you get told off by your folks or whatever. Drawing, for me, is it's at the crux of my practice, so I've always been really interested in how other artists engage with it and also, through all that, what actually is drawing and how how we perceive drawing as to what how other artists use it within their practice. Mm, it, yeah you're, you're right because there really is no right or wrong way to draw essentially but and, and everyone sort of approaches it very very differently and you've given some really when we were talking about what we could talk about you've given a real varied approach from a range of different artists across the centuries and across the history of art and it's really interesting even just to see not just how they personally as an artist have tackled the idea of drawing or perhaps in some cases completely bypass the need and or the importance of it mm-hmm. but also a development in the materials as well that's something that I've when I was talking a little bit earlier about the rabbit holes that it sort of sent me down um, <laughs> it's been really it's been so interesting so I think the first thing I think we need to talk about is of course this incredible Leonardo da Vinci sketch drawing that you that you sent me um, do you want to tell everyone at home just a little bit about what's on the page yeah, well, it's, it's the famous page of one of Da Vinci's sketchbooks of cats. And on the page, there's cats in all different positions, be it on, on all fours, lying down. Um, just really, to me, it's just exploring what that, the anatomy of a cat, how it looks in all different positions. And for me, it's... It's actually just showing the cogs of Da Vinci's head, just working everything out, and his um, observational skills just are are a sight to behold. No pun intended. Yeah, it's, it's a fantastic little page. But like, I could have picked any page from Da Vinci's sketchbooks. They're all it's just a treasure trove of ideas and um, and inspiration and how he goes about the drawing mark and how he uses those marks to inform himself for either later works or to get his idea across it's it's such an incredible like you said study of 
you know the anatomy of animals and it's really really interesting to see because there's I mean a rough guess I would say there's maybe like 10 to 15 very sort of mini sketches within this page where he's really sort of taking cats sort of prancing or sort of curled up cleaning themselves and um, oddly enough though there is what appears to be some sort of like dragon doodle so I really like that idea of him just sort of like being in his studio and just sort of letting his imagination sort of run wild and sort of exploring how the evolution of animals even mystical ones yeah. like the, the dragon I think it's it's really fun it's like sort of linking it back to mythology which he was always really interested in isn't it absolutely and what I love as well is that he also like in this page he has like little notes to himself and I don't know if you've if you've seen at the bottom so this one funnily enough this uh, this page from his sketchbook is actually uh, owned by Bristol Museums oh really yeah which is really funny because you've got you've got your sister there so I was like oh I wonder if that's if, if you knew that but yeah so this is actually in Bristol Museum and Art Galleries collection and um, which is like their collective term and on their website so they describe the work a little bit and then and then it says at the note at the bottom on flexion and extension the lion is prince of this animal species because of the flexibility of its spine and that's quoting what da Vinci scribbles at the bottom wow so it's re- yeah it's really really interesting uh, it also says that he would have had access not of course not just to sort of like street cats but da Vinci actually had access to lions because they used to keep lions in Florence because it was the symbol of the city so they had them in, in the palace in Florence which I think is really really interesting of course because uh, da Vinci was I, I, I'm sure he was he the court artist I'm not I'm not 100% sure if he if he was but he, he was very influential sort of scientist thinker and and like you said in these sketchbooks it's not just sort of animals that he depicts it's it's all sorts of manner of things and how he reworks them and there's a really great video, I'll send you the link to it actually, about how he even used to have to mix up different things to even work on paper because it's not, you have to remember, these things weren't readily available. You couldn't just like pop to the art shop. Mm-hmm. These things had to be prepared and made. So I think that that in itself has just allowed me to have a whole new appreciation to how Da Vinci works. And um, what's really lovely as well in the collection and particularly in this drawing as well, when you zoom in, you can see where he's sort of, worked underneath you know done like an underdrawing sort of thing and then went over went over it again which I really love that idea that even da Vinci didn't always get it 100% right or school yeah it's like uh because of not not, not the scarcity of materials but the the, ex- the extension of time in which materials could be used or could be or were ready it just makes you appreciate the you know, every mark had to be carefully thought out and planned in advance. And then, as you say, like, you know, obviously in the ske- in the preliminary sketch underneath, you know, there is that rough working out phase in it. Mm. And I think what's important as well to remember is, you know, these are sketchbooks. These weren't, these are things that were never meant to be seen. And yet now they're considered works of art in themselves. Exactly. Yeah. Um, wh- I'm not entirely sure when when would drawing have been seen as works on as and of themselves prior to this or after this. Um, mm. So what what I had found is like round about the 16th century is when people started to think, oh, drawing is part of you know it's a valid part to anyone's sort of collection. But yeah, before this, this was essentially these were books that were to sit on a shelf and, and never really be seen. Yeah, for the RSIs only. It's, um, no, it's, it's really, really interesting. But also I think it's very much like an expression of the time as well because drawing was really seen as like the foundation of any sort of art, you know, the crutch of any sort of artist's skill. And I found this really interesting quote by an Italian writer and painter called Giorgio Vasari, who's kind of credited in the 15th, hundreds to essentially writing the first sort of art historical text on artists and the the quote that I've got is drawing is the necessary beginning of everything in art and not having it one has nothing so what do you think of that as a as an artist sort of modern day sort of creative yeah well well, there's there's somebody we're going to talk about later on that will definitely disagree with that uh (laughs) but I would for me personally, I would say yes to an extent. 
there are I do know many artists that don't draw at all and still they make fantastic pieces of work, um, be they sculpture or you know video installations, performance. There's an artist I know who works really with text to get their ideas across, and then it, it translates from the text to video and audio. So maybe technology has a hand in that where certain artists sort of bypass that step, if you know what I mean. Mm, yeah. That's so interesting. I think, though, that it leads it leads quite nicely into the next person who uh, we're going to talk about, who is Maggie Hambling. You sent me um, a really wonderful suggestion for a BBC documentary that she took part in. Can you tell us a little bit about maybe Maggie and, and what her approach to, to drawing is? Oh, Maggie Hambling is a force of nature. Uh she really is just like there's a law unto herself. I think she's absolutely fantastic. Um, but that documentary was Maggie Hambling, Making Love with Paint, I think it was. And it was basically just the BBC documentary crew following her as she worked on this one piece, but then it went off on tangents about her her life and her her approach to making art in her studio. And there was a bit in it where you know she gets up at five or six every morning. And she works in her sketchbook without fail every morning. And I just find that approach so interesting because the drawings are sometimes are just like just, just scribbles. There's nothing sort of figurative or um, formal about them. It's just gestural marks as a way of probably just exercising the hand and um, getting the brain going. But yeah, it's, the, the documentary is definitely worth watching. Yeah, it's really it's she's such an interesting an interesting artist. Is this the one as well where it starts off? Because I'm now slightly panicking that perhaps I've seen something different from what you had suggested. And it's the one where it starts off and she's there's someone in her studio and she's like drawing from life. Is this a different thing? That I I've think watched? that might be a different one. <laughs> Great. Well, there's loads for you to watch then, everyone at home. And um, this one was really interesting because she describes drawing as a battlefield. And that with her work, you know, she says, you know, drawing's a battlefield. It comes alive and then it dies on you. Then it comes alive, then it dies on you again. And there's this constant sort of battle with the page in drawing. And she then quotes uh, Giacometti, who's a very famous sculptor, and says that um, the process of making art, it's like a blind man groping in the dark. <laughs> but she's... um. She's some I have to I have to agree with you. She is just this absolute force and I don't know, like very iconic, can completely hold her own space, takes no nonsense women. And she was really quite incredible to watch. Yeah, I think I know that the documentary you watched, it was think I think it was like the late eighties, early nineties. Um mm, this was, one was yeah. just uh last year, I think. Oh, well, then I definitely have not watched that one then. So there's those yeah. things to watch as well. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> um, but like one of the things that like that drawing I sent you of like the self-portrait is from the it's from the mid 80s. Mm. And immediately you can tell it's her, but it's just there's such an energy in it in the, the marks in the hair. And I think well for me, like the the marks are so immediate and so gestural. And my favorite artists or the artists that, that say something to me are the ones that are able to translate that initial energy from a sketchbook or the page and translate that to what would people call like in commas a finished work or a realized piece. For me, that mm. that's the crux of how do you get that initial idea with with that energy and that pace and translating it so that that is still there still present in in the development stage do you know and I think for me Maggie mm. her first name basis now me and Maggie um she has that in spades her her paintings like the even the seascapes um that she did a few years ago she still does or there's such an energy with that with those works that um, it's just incredible. So I've got this um, this portrait in front of her and the documentary that I watched, um, Making Their Mark, it's called, and it's all about six artists, although the only one I could find okay. was with Maggie, about their process with drawings and it's still on BBC iPlayer now. And it's just, so the opening scene of it is, is just like her smoking 
And that kind of seems to be a very sort of big theme in our life is like, you know, sort of pencil or charcoal in one hand and then a fag in the other. And it's just, for me, when I see this, and you had, when you sent it to me, you didn't even say it's a self-portrait, but I just knew straight away it was her. And for me, like the energy, like you said, in, in, the, in the application of the charcoal, just really sort of sums up her energy and her personality and even sort of like the smoke that sort of fills her studio. Um, there's just something so beautiful about it. And yeah, it's, it'd be so funny to see if people at home that are, uh, you know, you can see all these um, images on my Instagram and on my website as well that we discuss. It would be interesting to see, because for me, I look at that and I think it's, it's, it's finished. Yeah, there's nothing more else you could do with that. It's it does exactly what it says on the tent. You know what she set out to do. I think. Well, that's it. And in this documentary as well, she has this really interesting sort of chat about how she really doesn't like the the idea of someone calling something like this a sketch, um, because she feels it's demeaning. Because essentially, regardless of where you're drawing, be it on like a beautiful canvas or you know a scrap bit of paper, you know, or the back of an envelope on a on a napkin in a restaurant you know your your boundaries of where you can draw are very much set out oh so as an as an artist would you would you agree with something like that you know these sort of because I, I essentially if, you know for me personally as someone who I, I'm not an artist I'm just a great admirer um for me if I picked up you know a napkin and you know did a little drawing I wouldn't call that a drawing I'd call that a doodle but perhaps someone like yourself if, if you picked it up and you drew me something on a napkin I would call it a drawing and I would look at it like a piece of art. I think I, when I was younger, I would have been a bit more uh, precious over what I drew on um, and a bit more snobbish. Um, but now I think anything goes really. There's, I think, um, mm. was it who was it that actually had a, a conversation with, um, with Francis Bacon and, it was it was Stephen Fry actually talked about you know, I'm I'm looking to get to this place how do you get there, and Francis Bacon was trying to tell Stephen Fry you know this is where you get he goes, oh no draw me a map, and uh, so Fran Francis Bacon drew out the map and then he went to give it to him and then he ripped it up so to say some chance to say you could sell that, you know it was just on a piece of paper or a napkin but that that drawing could have been worth something because it was by his hand. Yeah, it's so true. And there's so many incidents, actually, now that you're saying that. Because was it not a few years ago? Oh, my goodness, this is where I'm going to get his name wrong. Gerhard Richter, the German yeah. the German artist, he, he ended up taking someone to court because someone had gone through the bins of his studio and he'd started works and then essentially chucked them out because he was like, nah, they're no good. And someone raided the bins oh of his God. studio and tried to sell the work that they found in the bin so now so now anything he does he makes sure it's incinerated before it goes in because essentially just to sort of save himself from that happening yeah again. i think that's that's one thing that, that bacon also did as well he he got his neighbor to actually destroy them take them out and destroy them yeah did he um, because he was so scared of people rummaging through the bins and kerchinging off off of his rejected pieces it's it, yeah it's just amazing and I th I wonder why though do you do you think it's perhaps a an art historical problem that we've had you know that um that the canvas is seen as the sort of elitist higher art yeah that well, I think that's, that's something that's that would still probably be seen as part of the the canon as is now which thankfully has started to come a part of the scenes in regards yeah, I say it would be a, it would be like a top down, it would be at the top of that pyramid. It probably shouldn't be anymore. I think there's, there's definitely, mm -hmm. um, you know, there shouldn't be high art or low art. It should just be art in my in my eyes. Um, if if the work's good enough, doesn't matter what it's on or what it's made of, it should be. Yeah, it should be uh, seen just as that, um, and not whether it's you know perfectly framed or what have you um that, that would be my thoughts on that yeah absolutely you know it doesn't it doesn't need to have this big sort of I don't know inner it doesn't need to cause this big inner revelation essentially if if you like it and regardless if you find meaning behind it or not as art you know you could you could knock something together out of 
I don't know, like a discarded plank of wood and it'd be the most incredible thing ever. You could paint and draw in it. And it doesn't matter. It's interesting because I had this conversation with someone yesterday and we were talking about um, using sort of technology and drawing and art. So in particular, we're talking about this is a very sort of way out curveball conversation that we're having about sort of David Hockney's iPad drawings and the sort of um, controversy that happened when he started using an iPad and then printing what he'd made on an iPad and placing it in galleries and people were in uproar being like, that's not art, that's not art, but I would, which I would completely disagree with. And I think someone like Maggie would disagree with that as well, putting words in her mouth now, because essentially drawing is really difficult. Yeah. And it's it's the mark of a good artist. But if, I remember being at school and, and being told that drawing is the foundation and, and the more that you work on it, the more it sort of seeps through and improves every aspect of your art. Or then, and, then, and, then, and then, sorry to completely there, contradict that, um, is Picasso spent a lifetime learning how to draw and paint mm. and then spent the rest of his life trying to forget it. Mm, well, that's it. That's it. And it's just, I really do think it's wherever you sit with the, with the argument. Because I, I, for me, having absolutely no art sort of background in education, but my sister, for example, is an illustrator and she spent a lot of her time, her first, um, she had initially signed up to go to Glasgow School of Art and she did a, um, like a portfolio course and she said all they tried to do the entire time she was there was like teach her sort of like the sort of the old sort of traditional academic yep. way of drawing you know very sort of realistic very rigid there's no guessing and she hated it she said it was really boring and and she ended up leaving and then trying illustration and, and loving it because there was this sort of freeness in what she could create and draw and that sort of traditional path didn't suit her and I think that's something quite interesting because Maggie although is traditionally trained is very much and very much is you know she sort of champions drawing but she's better known for her sculpture which I find really interesting yeah um I, I don't know I, I I would say there is a place for that sort of formal drawing because um like sort of teaching um, because once you know it or have an idea of it you can then find ways to bend it to your own no I don't want to say the word style because I hate that word but to your own to your own practice mm, yeah it's funny because then going on to the next person that you that you sent me who you've men mentioned very briefly Francis Bacon yeah so what was his approach to, to drawing? Uh, well, according to him, there was no approach to drawing whatsoever. Um, I think a quote of his is, uh, and if I drew something first, then my paintings would be illustrations of drawings. Um, so he, well, in my head, he sort of looked down on them, on, on drawings. But I look at that piece that I sent you, that the bowl, which is, you know, considered the last painting that, he was working on before his death so it is unfinished um there is drawing elements in it um if you go by the the, the dictionary definition of a drawing which is one of them is uh, a graphic representation by lines of an object or an idea a delineation of form without reference to color and in that painting there's there's no it is black and white there is no color um bar the, the bare canvas that is you know is primed at the back um and People have this, you know, you've, you've heard of people saying an oil sketch. Surely, yeah. surely an oil sketch yeah. is, is, is merely a drawing in oil. Um, well, I, I would agree. I would agree with that. But, um, but no, no, I, I don't think go, there's any more to go on. I think, um, yeah, I just think that the way, even the way Bacon forms his sort of glass rooms around objects and other works, um, there is still that formal line there, albeit it is a painterly line, but it's, it's usually in, in like a dark colour, so you could read it as a drawing or an outline of a room um, in some of his works. Um, and I know some people will hear that and say, oh, not oil sketch, surely there's tone and colour in that. Yes, there is. But um, I would I would argue that 
even if you look at the likes of Frank Auerbach's drawings and charcoal, and then his oil sketches of this the same image, those thick marks have just been translated from a drawing, thick charcoal mark to a thick slab of paint. It's it's still essentially the same mark, only just in a different medium. Sort of copy paste, <laughs> if you will, like Bacon was uh, trying to um, avoid. Trying to avoid? Yeah, like like he said, you know, he didn't want if he copied his paintings it would just be if his paintings were copying drawings it would yeah be... he said if i drew something first then my paintings would be illustrations so i think he he looked down on on that act of drawing um which is so bizarre because him and maggie handling were good friends um which is just completely different approaches or uh, different ideas as to what painting means to them well that's it and then i think it kind of comes back round to that is there a right or wrong way to approach something? If it works, how it works for one person doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for exactly another. Like you said, very much with um, Maggie and Francis Bacon. And I'm not surprised they were very good friends. I didn't know that fact, but I'm in no way surprised. They seem like they would be very good company. <laughs> Imagine that for a house party. Um, oh my gosh, it would be an absolute dictionary <laughs> definition of a riot. <laughs> But um, this this piece in particular that that um that you that you sent me um there's a lot of people sort of sort of reaching for for meanings behind this because as you said this was the last or it's thought to be the last known piece that Bacon um began before he died so what kind of things do people see when when they look at it well I think people look at it and they see you know that he was thinking of death a lot you know, he had a lot he as he was in ill health prior to to dying in madrid um but you know so this this bull that is half in light half in dark um you know there is you could look at there's still philosophical links to mortality there um and well picasso always was his you know picasso was the reason why bacon began painting he was his uh his hero so you know his and picasso's emblem of himself was the bull so whether um there's a nod to that there it's it's anybody's guess really um but you can you could have a field day writing an essay on the the moral quandaries or the philosophical meanings behind it no absolutely and it's been it's so interesting because it went it went missing for a really long time it ended up in someone's private collection and i think it was only about four or five years ago that it came to light when someone was researching for Bacon's uh, catalogue resume. And for anyone listening that doesn't know what a catalogue resume is, that's essentially as near as possible recording of every work an artist has ever done. And I say almost because it always tends to be that when these are published, people that have these works in private collections that don't advertise that they're with them will then contact the person and say, oh, actually, this wasn't included and that's why there's always like several um, sort of reprints of different things. But that's just a very brief uh, definition for anyone that doesn't know. But um, so, yeah, so it, it came to light in about 2015, 2016. And it actually will be on display to the public for the first time in wow. London this year. COVID permitting, of course. Um, so the Royal Academy of Arts have a Francis Bacon uh, retrospective and the owners who... Again, nobody knows who, who they are. Uh, it's all very sort of hush hush. Um, have allowed this this work to go on display for the first time. So it's a really really uh, big deal. So it'll be interesting to see um what and everyone that's listening if if you go on to look at it because I can kind of see the whole idea of he's sort of I don't know sort of trudging with the idea of dying because there's this the bull in itself. It's quite yeah, there's, it's not it's not um fully formed, is it? Yeah. And he's sort of almost sort of backing out of the the light into the darkness. So I suppose you know, there's when you when you know the backstory behind it, it can completely change. Yeah, it can how, totally how alter its perception, it. can't you? No, I was just going to ask: Have you ever have you ever been to Dublin? I have, yes. And is this his yes, the shrine <laughs> studio? Oh my gosh! Right, it's just. Right, explain to everyone at okay, home so what in is in the Dublin. The High, the High Lanes Gallery in Dublin, um, there is a, a permanent collection of, of some of Bacon's work and surrounding this work, or in the middle of this work, is this is the 
the the actual studio of Francis Bacon, which was move, moved from London, brick for brick, paint tube by paint tube, and placed in the gallery. So you actually you walk in, and you can you can stand on the, the doorway leading into the studio, but it's encased in glass, so you can you can peer in, but you can't go in. And it's just it's so eerie. You can even see the the sky the same skylight. Um, you know, the the, the light shines down in on and in the studio and his how he cleaned his brushes on the corners of the walls and um it's so eerie, it's like he's just left. Yeah, and it's just this amazing thing to see. So I actually I wandered into that gallery not knowing that was there. I had gone essentially for a completely different reason to Dublin. It wasn't supposed to be a cultural thing. I was meeting people and then I was like I've got some time I'll I'll, I'll see what museums are about and I went into this and because I remember seeing these images uh, when I was like a first year student in art history and they do a very sort of whistle stop tour of the history of art within you know across your first year and it's the mess of the studio I mean I cannot like I don't have enough words to describe the (laughs) absolute chaos that this studio is paint up the wall it looks it's just an. It's like I said. What was that old program? Was it Kim and Aggie? Yeah. Used to go in um, and like house clean. Oh my I think God. they would have a yeah, field day in there. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to do an impression of Aggie there, but I stopped myself. Oh my goodness! Just putting on their. I just have images of them putting on their marigolds and being like, right, let's get to work, with Kim. <laughs> yeah. But I think it also says something about his mental state as well. Of course, like he was. He was a huge drinker. Um. What was it? Was it? Was it? Drink that killed uh, him eventually. Um, yeah. Um, but I dare say was his it? his lifestyle would not have uh, attributed kindly to that. But yeah, and I remember going down specifically to see that piece way way back, or just that installation. And even mm. uh, like all, when you go around the other side of the gallery, there's these like little sort of peak holes, so you can see different angles and how yeah. you know. I think there's actually a canvas on the easel. Um, on and the I easel. don't know if there's yeah, anything right. on it. Um, but I think the Going back to the painting of the bull, somebody took a photograph of his studio just, you know, a day or two after he died. And that was the one painting that was on that same easel. Oh, really? Um, so oh, that's I'm how they, that you know, they assumed that was the last painting that he was working on before before passing away. Oh, it's just, it's so interesting. And he's got, what a, I need to get someone on to like talk about bacon. He's an absolute, like, again, a bit like sort of Maggie total force to be reckoned with and a really really interesting background and the fact that he was openly homosexual in a time when it was illegal in the UK as well is just incredible like he was this complete powerhouse just not even in the Soho area but like in the there's a really there's a really interesting film made in the late 90s uh, called Love is the Devil and okay. Derek Jacoby Jacoby? Jacoby? He plays Francis Bacon and Daniel Craig plays his lover. Really? And it is it is really good. It's one of it's one of my favourite sort of art based films. Um, because it just goes through their relationship and uh you know, leading up to the the French uh the retrospective at the the Grand Palais he had in the early seventies and then how mm-hmm. don't want to spoil it but Daniel Craig the, his lover, you know, committed suicide just before the show, opening of the show. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, wow. <laughs> Spoiler oh, it's all right. Don't worry. <laughs> it's it all right. is. It's, it is. But it's, it's, it's definitely it's a film <laughs> with a real, I think they tried just to get that sort of gritty, dark rawness of his work across in the actual how they, how they approach the film. So, yes, yeah, definitely, definitely worth looking mm. up. Love is the Devil, it's called. Thank you. Oh, well, I'm definitely going to watch that. And if anyone watches it at home on uh, sort of Brian's request, like do write us and let us know what you think about it. Um, Because essentially we've got quite a lot of time on our hands. Thanks, lockdown 3.0 or whatever lockdown version will be on. I know. (laughs) When this is released. (laughs) Um, So let's move on a little bit from uh, from Bacon, who is this incredible, oh my gosh, absolute powerhouse. And the next sort of interesting attempt to, tackling the whole concept of drawing and or I see where you're going. not drawing if you will <laughs> yes um have a guess what i'm trying to talk about here <laughs> could it be the erased de kooning drawing by robert rauschenberg ding ding 100 points to you this is so interesting explain to everybody at home maybe a wee bit about who rauschenberg is and- robert rauschenberg was Nobody. an american artist who would be sort of 
be in that sort of conceptual field. Uh, I think he went to Black Mountain College um, in the 60s, 50s and 60s. And um, I think he had this idea of uh, erasing a drawing and he couldn't just rub out one of his own drawings because then what would be the point? So I think he actually said, who, who is really respected at this time? And um, in American art at the time, de Kooning was the godfather, the in- whole enchilada. So I think he he came to his house with a bottle mm. of Jack Daniels and said his idea. And I think de Kooning said it's a great idea. I like the idea. And he... But he hated, he, he said it was a good idea for a work, I think, but I think he hated the, the thought, the thought yeah. of doing it. The concept. Um, which is yeah. probably why he did, he did accept and he did do a drawing for Rauschenberg. But the fact that it took 40 erasers to erase the Kooning's drawing, he, the Kooning probably made it as hard as possible to rub it out. Um, but it's like, if if you if you think of the fact it took over you know 40, 40 rubbers to remove the de Kooning, but if you look at the piece of paper, there's not one crinkle, there's not one crease. It was done with extreme care. You know, you, you rub out anything on a piece of paper, and you know if you go too fast, it, it'll just crumple. It'll you know it'll dog leaf dog ear or anything. The fact is, it is mm. pristine in terms of creases. But I just like this idea. I, I put this in and sent this to you because it's that idea of the concept of drawing. What is a drawing? Is there a like a rebellious act there? Is it a collaboration? Is it a, a defilement of here's a new here's a new up and coming young buck getting rid of the old and I am the new wave. So it's like that is that act of drawing by one and then the sub- subsequent removal of another and. There's that sense of uh, ownership, like who owns the drawing? Is it is it a Rauschenberg because it he rubbed it out, or is it a de Kooning because he initially he drew the initial work? And you can see in it there is little hints of a torso or an arm here. The paper seems to have sort of yellowed with time, but there is if you zoom in on it, you can see little squiggles and sort of dents where the you know the, the the pencil went into the paper. I think it's just, it's fascinating. It, it really is. And like, I had come across this very briefly when I studied art history. And it was so great to actually have a bit of time to sort of dedicate to sort of reading into it. And you, you're right, it, it's really sparked this big sort of art historical debate. Like, what does it mean? Is it, is it an act of defiance? Is it rebellion? Is it destruction? But Rauschenberg was really like no it's not destruction like I really respect him as an artist and that's why I chose him because he was you know the epitome of what we were all trying to work towards and be and yeah yeah, and I think it's so interesting that when he selected this piece I found this really great uh, four minute sort of interview with Rauschenberg actually talking about this piece and I'll include it in the show notes below and, and I'll send it on to you as well Brian it's really really interesting Love the idea that he just turned up at the door with a bottle of Jack exactly. Daniels. How all good things start. We'll just say that. Now. <laughs> and in this interview, what he says is de Kooning was like, I'm not going to make this easy for you. I'm going to give you something that I'll miss, but also it's going to be really hard for you to destroy it. And he gave him this, like you said, this drawing, but it wasn't just sort of charcoal and pencil. It was crayon. There was also paint and all sorts of different things. And then I found this amazing image in a Guardian article where they've actually taken a scan. They've taken like an X-ray of the work and you can see, like you said, the sort of pression outlines. You know, when you, if you lean too heavy on a bit of paper when you're writing, it sort of presses through onto the the page before or after. Um, You can kind of see this in in the X-ray. So it's really, really interesting. And um, Rauschenberg was like, I respect this man so much, but it took him, he said, and he made it really difficult for me to destroy it. Like you said, it took 40 different sort of erasers and uh, to sort of get rid of it. But it, he said it took over a month to do because, and he worked on it meticulously and with great care to, to get rid of it. And it's just, it's such a an interesting concept to, um, I don't know, reclaim, put, put your own put mark no on work, work. work together. What I mean, what? Yeah, what is it? 
like you said, is it a collaboration? I mean, who knows? It's so, so interesting. And it really didn't, um, it didn't go on display. So this was made in 1953. And that's it. Even me saying made, I'm like, was it made? How, how, what do you do? Unmade. Oh, it was unmade in 53. I, I'm a wee bit, that's it. I mean, you've completely, I come lost for words, Brian. And to be honest, as a Glaswegian, that is... There must be the Celtic collab so well we're having here. <laughs> well, that's it. That's it. Um, yeah, it's such an interesting piece. Can you remember the first time it you came was, across this uh, and what in, you thought? In art college, I went to the the Belfast School of Art way back, and it, it was uh, we had a, a wonderful teacher or tutor. Um, we had specialised in drawing. Her name was Doris Rohr. I think she showed this in a a lecture on on drawing and on, on on drawing as it were and I was I was blown away. I was like, how could this be seen as art? But I think it's just as time has gone on, I've just learned to appreciate the the concept behind it. And um you might be able to remember the name of remember the the name of the artist who did the the d- dictionary definition of a chair the photograph of a chair and then an actual chair oh. in the installation then it was like which one is the oh, chair it yeah, sounds very it, dishonest it, it is a contemporary if I'm piece very um, uh, what oh god but yeah no, that's that's when i first seen the seen the Rauschenberg okay. slash de Kooning or the de Rauschenberg Kooning as i call it yeah and it's so and and then he also got which is really interesting he then got another artist to there's a little thing at the at the bottom that says erase de Kooning drawing robert Rauschenberg 1953 oh, really? another artist made that for him i've got jasper yeah, well, john were, were, in my head for some time, reason um oh well then it might be or they like the his he, his studio was next to Rauschenberg's or something um and he was the one that wrote that and then framed it and put it in an exhibition for him so then there was that conversation of in this um sort of youtube uh, interview that I found was it then like this three way collaboration of three artists that had worked together to make this thing but it's it's such an interesting concept of I, I just don't know what I make of it I think it's I think it's genius actually and, and I love the whole story behind it so essentially uh, what, what they say in the interview is when the work was displayed in sort of 1955 no one really no one really cared about the work it was the story that, that actually what got yeah. the attention more than what the piece did itself so yeah kind of kind of going back though to, 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 to that bacon really you know like it's sometimes you need to know the story behind it in order to for it to, to have a significance and an importance and, and make you look again so it's it's interesting it's just definitely, when, definitely just when I get get this in um, um that but then, one, it was called one and three chairs and it was by Joseph Kosuth um which is the, oh, the, the, the chair the photograph of the chair and then the dictionary definition I, uh, I think I seen it in the Centre Pompidou, Paris, a couple of years ago. So that reminded me of okay of this drawing, the undrawing rather of um, Rauschenberg. You know that idea of the the concept almost being more more interesting than the physical work. Yeah, this is. Do you know what? I can't help but think uh, this has just popped into my mind right now. So like. I'm just going to say it. This is such a good question for like an art history pub quiz. Just going to say it. Like, so interesting. Like, what famous artists are based on other ones? Art you should definitely work. do that. It's just. I would join. <laughs> well, funnily enough, I've got like an art history quiz, you know, when um, the world broke to begin with and everyone <laughs> and their gran was doing like a Zoom quiz. I put. I put together like a like an art history Zoom quiz and I put it up an art oh, history really? quiz and I put it up on my blog for people to use just if they wanted to do like an art round. Yeah, because I thought um, so I had four rounds and then the last round was like a sculpted round. So the idea was I said to people, you know, you can you know order online or if you've got blue tack or something and um, get people to sort of build or, or draw a painting and you can do it like that. You can try and do it over Zoom, you know, trying to get people like creative and thinking about art. So that's still on my blog if anyone is ever in need of any sort of art questions. But maybe that that could be a once. I, I don't know. I think everyone's a bit sick of pub quizzes. At, well, virtual quizzes at the moment. It's more of a <laughs> when we can yeah, all go into a pub be, again and, and do a quiz. Um, maybe. <laughs> um, OK, so the last artist that you sent me, I, I, I'll be very honest 
I don't know very much about this artist at all. And I really very much got sucked down a rabbit hole of uh, sort of materials and things like that. So can you just tell us a little bit about the last artist that you sent me and and um, yeah, well, um, their approach the, to drawing? I'm going to be completely honest as well. I don't overly know too much either. I've seen, I've seen their work recently from a publication mm -hmm. of a group show that they were in um, in the Whitechapel Gallery. Um, and the show was called Radical Figures, Painting in the New Millennium. Okay. And the artist's name is Sanya Kantorovsky. And uh, the painting that I sent you is called Feeder. It's actually in the Tate collection. Um, so it, it sort of depicts this yeah. ominous figure in blue with a, a Napoleon-esque black hat. And they're force feeding this smaller figure, this sort of acid green um, liquid in a, on a spoon. Um, but for me, it just... It, it just epitomized what I get excited about when I see artists who merge um, different approaches to mark making. Um, the top third of the painting that you can see that the colors in the painting bouncing off each other. I think it's oil and oil pastel on canvas. Um, but within the, the, the two figures, there is this real sketch like drawing element in the in the hands and in, in the mouth even in that the hat just does dark the dark hat also kind of looks like a, a mountain going across with the sun and the, or a, a disc in the middle um but even the, the sort of like classical ruffle of the of the neck the the way that that uh, Kantorowski has, has done the collar. It seems to be one continuous line waving up and down, going, you know, I don't know if he's left or right-handed, so right to left or left to right. Um, but that, it, it just it just screams energy to me. And that's, to me, that's what just gets me excited about seeing work for the first time. And when I first seen this, I just, it blew me away. Mm, and I think it's so interesting to hear, you know, your description of it, because it's, I... This is, I think this is the great thing about art because I would look at that when I've looked at this painting rather I didn't see any of that and it's just and as you've described it I'm like oh my gosh it, 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 I can totally see where you're coming from with the whole idea of the different it almost sort of every element almost breaks up yeah. the page in a different way if that makes sense like there's like the sky then there's the it's clearly defined by the hat and it's the sort of what I'm assuming is like a Jacobean rough or something like that like and then the very sort of vivid almost sort of ocean blue which is very sort of I don't know it, it's not a solid color it's very sort of very much yeah it's more of a wash in and out, of a... The, the term for that the sort of stuff <laughs> yes thank you <laughs> gosh this is why we shouldn't record late after and apparently after three o'clock I can't string a sentence together so there we go and then that really I love how you described it that acid green on the spoon it just oh my gosh yeah it's sort of sinister I don't know is it like a who are these figures you know is it some poor orphan child being like forced yeah. aid medicine I but don't the, know like it's even the even the way that so, that, so that smaller figure's face is is sort of described in these few marks of oil pastel it, maybe it's because of the medium or it's just the way it's drawn mm. it reminded me of the work of Paula Rego. She works primarily now in oil pastel. And even though people still see her as an artist or that who works in painting, right now she primarily just works in oil pastel. Um, but she's still seen as a painter, which I find is really interesting because the medium shouldn't depict the artist. The artist should depict the medium. Mm. And and just really quickly, who is uh, Paula Rego? Like I don't I don't actually know a horrendous amount about her. I know that she has some works in the Tate, but out with that, it's not. Cool. Well, Paula Rego is a, um, a um, Portuguese artist who's been living and working in Britain for a long time. Um, she did a famous series of paintings depicting abortion. I think it was in the, the mid nineties, um, right when Portugal was. Um, Mm. they were doing a vote to legalize abortion and uh i don't think it went through at that point but they the vote came up again in, in the noughties and uh <clears throat> it went through and a lot of people attributed her her activism and her work to that 
um, really powerful work. Like I think she did a, a, a series of, I think, dog woman they were called, where it's like just these sort of animalistic woman on all fours. It just it was really raw, really emotional. Um, but it's if you looked at it from a distance, you think, oh, they're they're amazing paintings. But if you went up close, they're actually all in oil pastel. Yeah. Oh, I love um, I love when so artists it's just, can trick you like that. That reminded me. This work reminded me of Rego. Maybe it was because of the material, because it is a painting and there is oil pastel in it. But it's also just that that strong that strong gesture that uh, Kantorowski has in his work. I I also I actually picked up the publication that I talk about talked about that he's in the Radical Figures, um, mainly because I'm a huge fan of Michael Armitage that's in that show as well in the Whitechapel Gallery. <clears throat> and you, you, mm. you could say there is negative drawing in his work when he's painting in these blocks of colour, but leaving this line of underpainting between them. You know, there's, you could probably talk about painting within any artist's work all day. Like, how long can this podcast be? Well, that's it. Welcome back to part We're 17 old. of... Uh... <laughs> I know. <laughs> We've had three <laughs> birthdays since the podcast began, but... Uh... <laughs> Well, there you go. Maybe that's a new podcast in itself, sort of exploring how how artists draw or how they sort of where they begin. Because I think that's also it's the most difficult thing of, with anything is is starting, and then you know once once it gets going, it it takes you in all sorts of weird and, and wonderful directions. But um, I have to thank you. Like I, there has been so many amazing artists that you've brought to my attention. Uh, not only just during this chat, but also. Um, and researching for um, for this podcast as well. I mean, I, I, I had, for example, Maggie, I had heard of her. But like I said previously, I I associated her work with, with sculpture because obviously she has that yes, new controversial Britain, work that was unveiled a few Benjamin years ago. And, um, yeah. and then even more recently, the, um, the sculpture that was unveiled in November of the feminist yes. Mary Wollstonecraft. Oh my gosh, she's got some amount of stick for that. So yeah, so interesting to see her. Like, I really, yeah, what a character. What an absolute character. Okay. Um, I've got one more question for you before you go. It is the Joe's Art History Podcast and you can take this question as far or as sort of narrow to your own sort of personal experience as you mm-hmm. want. But my final question, it's a big one. Why is art important? That is a big one. Well, I think for me, I've heard other artists say this before, and I used to like, you know, blow it off as like cliche or whatever. But I think um, the year that we've all had, um, that was 2020, sort of made it more true in a sense, is art is survival. Um, it's a way of truly expressing ourselves of, um, you know, I, I, I touched on it earlier. I, I had a, a, an accident midway through last year when we were in the midst of the first lockdown. And um, there was a few months where I, I physically couldn't get into the studio anymore and reading my art books and getting doodling on the, in the sketchbook was to me, honestly, a lifesaver. It was, it was keeping my sanity. It was, it was giving me something to do and not worrying about the, the skull fracture and the bleeding on the brain that I had. And it, uh, it's like the best possible distraction I could have, I, I, I could have asked for. And so, yeah, for, for me, it's, it's survival. It's it's what we've always we've always done. We've always left our mark, whether whether people see it or not. It doesn't matter. It's um, it's just that that means of self expression that I think we all need as humans to do. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And um, yeah, it's a really great way to answer that question. So thank you so much. And I would completely agree with you. Like art has been my savior. Uh, not you know throughout 2020 as well and and reading and and learning and speaking to people about art and listening to other podcasts and programs about art is just yeah it's it's been a way of it's been a welcomed distraction and I don't know it's given me sort of purpose and direction and and it's so great to to hear that it's given you 
that survival I don't know a sort of hug that everyone yeah. needed in some way no, or no another problem. to get it's, through it's sort of been that, so um, thank you so much um for it's going having that whatever happen and then you know realizing how important art and art making is to me it sort of made me realize you know what I am on the right path this is what I want to do in life and I'll be damned if a pandemic is going to stop me do you know yeah here here I completely yeah completely agree with you and I hope that's that's one of the positive things that's that's come out of the you know the pandemic as well that it's kind of made people sort of reassess and think what's important to them and, and where where they want to be and, and it's big questions that you don't actually really in your you know the noise of the everyday yeah you're allowed really and, to and have, just how to important yourself that cultural and it. cultural institutions are in your own in your own area so like much. i would encourage yes, any, so every, anybody who's listening to um, when you can, or even when you can't now, go on to the, your own local art institutions or galleries or museums, websites, find out what they're doing, um, join in on online events, talks, because you could surprise yourself what you could get out of it. And most of them are free. That's it. And it's that whole, you know, the whole idea of this podcast and uh, what I write on my Instagram and Joe's Art History is to like really encourage people to engage with these with art collections. Yeah, no, they belong to us. Particularly your nation's yeah. ones because they're yours. Like your taxes go towards keeping these museums, you know, funded and open and able to, to view these incredible things. So yeah, definitely get out there and you just you just never know what. Yeah, exactly. Um, like you said you could just completely surprise yourself. Yeah, that for yeah, so survival for me, it's, it's been survival and sort of a reaffirmation of I'm on the right track. Brian, thank you so much for coming <laughs> on. I've had just the best time chatting to you and researching for this, and it's been so lovely to also hear your accent. I just I don't know if it's like a oh, Celtic thing, so but much. the Irish accent for me is just the best um, accent in the world. So it's been so a pleasure lovely. to chat to yourself as well. Um, I think. <laughs> so lovely. Out of all the Irish accents, I think the Derry accent has been voted the sexiest. Maybe it's the Derry Girls show has bumped it up. Um, definitely not Nadine Coy. She Do you know what? At all. Maybe. Um, but yeah, no, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to <laughs> have a chat with you and to go through some of these works that I haven't seen in a while and just get the grey matter going on drawing again. Just the idea of it. It's fantastic. Yeah, no, thank you so much. I mean, it's it was your idea. This was all your idea, so this is fabulous. Um, Brian, before you go, where can people find you? Because as you said, you're an artist, you're a maker. Where can people find what you're doing and what you're creating? So people can find me on uh, my website, which is briankilt.com, K-I-E-L-T. And uh, my social media handle, I think, is the same for both Twitter and Instagram, which is B Kilt Artist, so B K I E L T Artist. Amazing. And um, I'll leave links to your website and your Twitter and your Instagram handle in the show notes below. Brian, thank you so, so much. Thank you. And, and good luck um, with the rest yeah, of the podcast. It's have been a great. really lovely rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Right. Bye. And there you have it, the end of another episode of the Joe's Art History Podcast. Once again, I would just like to thank Brian for coming on the podcast and just being so brilliant talking about all the different artists and really providing a really stimulating conversation and a really thought-provoking one. And I really loved having Brian on the podcast and I really hope you guys enjoyed this episode as much as I did recording and prepping for it as well. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please make sure to like, rate and subscribe, which not only means you will never miss another podcast episode, but apparently it helps other people find the podcast as well, which is always something I'm aiming to do. Speaking of helping other people find the podcast, if you know any of your friends that would perhaps be interested in listening to my conversation with Brian today, please do pass on the episode. It really, really helps. Also, if you've enjoyed listening to Brian, why don't you head over to his Instagram account, check him out and give him a wee follow. I must say, he, his work is incredible and very Francis Bacon-esque in places as well, if you're that way inclined. As always, you can get in touch with me to discuss anything on today's episode. You can email me, joesarthistory at gmail.com or you can contact me on Instagram via my DMs. 
at Joan's Art History. My DMs are always open and I'm always happy to chat. It's always brilliant to hear from people who have enjoyed the podcast or they have questions or on the odd occasion I've had people get in touch asking for like further reading on things. I'm more than happy to sort of point you in the right direction of things. I'm just happy to help and here to help. And hey, while you're on my Instagram, why not give me a wee follow? I don't just post about what I talk about in the podcast. I also post and write about art continuously in all different shapes and forms, be that architecture, stained glass. At the moment, I'm still sort of working my way through my A to Z of great women artists, which I'm having a lot of fun researching and writing for. All images that we discussed in this podcast can be viewed via my website, www.joesarthistory.com. Although I am thinking of removing the images from the website because it's starting to look a little bit messy. So if anybody out there has any suggestions of a way that I can present them better and or perhaps folder them, I'm in no way technical savvy, says the girl with the podcast. Any suggestions are always welcome. You can also view all the images on my Instagram page, which once again is at Joe's Art History. Finally, I've been Joe McLaughlin, your resident art historian and your host. And thank you so, so much for listening today. I'll be back next week with another brand new episode. So I look forward to welcoming you back then on the Joe's Art History podcast. Until then, keep learning and remember, art is for all. Bye.